sort of started off for us. So, Julia. Hi. Hi. Julia Collins is the co-founder and CEO of Planet Forward and co-founder of Zoom Pizza. She founded Zoom Pizza in 2015 with the mission of feeding the world while protecting the planet. Just a small little objective there. <laughs> Three years later, Zoom was valued at $2.25 billion, making Julia the first black woman. <laughs> making Julia the first black woman to found a unicorn company. The magic of Zoom is that they have built technology to solve the logistical problem, slowing down our food supply chain, technology that every food company in the industry could benefit from. Julie has always been passionate about food and about the industry and giving people access to healthy and, affo and affordable food. In 2010, she partnered with two friends to create MexiQ, which began as a food truck and has turned into a growing restaurant group those of you in New York may be familiar. <laughs> this year, Julia kicked off a new business venture, Planet Forward, with the mission of reversing global warming through food, just another small objective. In her spare time, Julia is an angel investor with a focus on funding women and people of color. So welcome, Julia. Thanks. Jessica Matthews is the CEO and founder of Uncharted Power, an award-winning power and data infrastructure company that she founded when she was 22 years old. She has described herself as the perfect mashup between Bill Nye the Science Guy and Beyonce. <laughs> I think you're channeling Beyonce right now. Bill, Bill, Bill Nye is here too. You just don't, you don't see him yet. As a junior in college, she created the Socket, a soccer ball that turns the energy from being kicked around into renewable and portable energy source. For developing countries and communities living in poverty with no electricity or frequent outages, it's a game changer. She expanded into energy producing jump ropes and skateboards and then rebranded Uncharged Play to Uncharted Power with a mission to provide cost efficient energy for the developing world. The company is focused not just on products that put systemic solutions that can generate, transmit, and store power to underserved communities. Her list of accolades includes Fortune's Most Promising Women Entrepreneurs, Forbes 30 Under 30, Inc. Magazine's 30 Under 30, and Harvard Scientist of the Year. How did I get involved in this panel? <laughs> And now we have Lindsay Vaughn. I'm not as smart or as successful. <laughs> so I only went to Harvard for four days. That's all I got. <laughs> she is the winningest female skier in the world and one of the most decorated Woo! alpine skiers in U.S. history. Woo! Many of us have watched her compete over the years and cheered her on as she refused to let injuries slow her down. She has earned a world record, 82 World Cup wins. I actually had to Google that just to make sure this was right. <laughs> 82 World Cup wins, 20 FIS Alpine World Cup titles, and is the only American woman to win downhill gold at the 2010 Olympics. Ooh. In 2015, she started the Lindsey Vaughn Foundation, a nonprofit focused on empowering young girls by building self-esteem and positive self-image. Because of that work, People Magazine named Lindsay to their 25 Women Changing the World list in 2016. Lindsay's book, Strong is the New Beautiful, was published in 2016, and I hear she's working on a new memoir coming out later this year. She's now starting a new chapter as a businesswoman and entrepreneur with the launch of a new beauty brand. All right, so pretty accomplished ladies up here with me. And uh, Lori Beer has inspired us by talking about her Pump Up Jam song. So I'm quite sure you ladies have one. So I'm going to start with our little lightning round with that. So Lindsay, do you have a Pump Up Jam song? Ah, oh, that's a aggressive starter. <laughs> um, I don't know. Probably, oh, Tory Lanez. That's good. I don't know. I don't know what song, but any of his songs <laughs> All right. are good. It's a rap, little rap, Pump Up. How about you, Jessica? I, uh, Is it Beyonce? <laughs> you know what? My my alarm to wake up uh, for the last like three or four years has been a song off of the Lemonade album, um, the one with Jack White. Uh, don't hurt yourself. Is that what it's called? Is it Don't You Hurt Yourself? So I wake up and it's just like Don't Hurt Yourself, and it's very, <laughs> it's like a very Who the, do you think I am? And like I just get up every morning. So, so I guess. <laughs> That's it. Not hurting yourself. Uh, no, it's more like to anyone else in the vicinity. That's it. Not hurting yourself. Uh, no, it's more like to anyone else in the vicinity. Yeah, don't don't hurt yourself. That's it. All right, Julia. How about you? Oh my gosh, I have an almost two-year-old at home, 
So I listen to a lot of Baby Shark. <laughs> <laughs> and that puts me in a happy place. All right, here we go. <laughs> Whatever it takes. <laughs> All right, so now we'll get on to the serious stuff. So Jessica, let's start with you first. Uh, your company, Uncharted Power, started as a single product, the Socket Soccer Ball, and has become something much more big and, imp and impactful. You're now focused on ways to bring energy to underserved communities and countries. Can you describe some of the problems your company is trying to solve, and when was there a moment where you realized it was much bigger than the soccer ball? Sure. So, you know, from the beginning, I came into this knowing this was an infrastructural issue, right? So I'm a dual citizen of Nigeria and the United States, and Nigeria, like most places in the global south, has a real infrastructural problem, specifically around energy access. It doesn't matter whether you're in the, uh, the village or if you're in the bustling city of Lagos, you can expect to lose power several times a day. And it's not that it's a socioeconomic issue. Uh, in fact, people are actually paying more per kilowatt hour in places like Nigeria than they are here. It's that you have nothing to pay into. You don't have any system. The problem, of course, is that when I was 19 years old, infrastructure could not have, it was literally the scariest thing I could have imagined. So, of course, in my mind, I'm like, I'm not the one to do anything with infrastructure. I'm not the person who could change that. But maybe I could try to create something that would inspire people to join the movement and feel like they had some agency, people like my own cousins. So that's where the invention of the socket came from. It was this idea to create something that was very tangible, very playful, but could kind of ultimately break down the barriers we put in front of ourselves when it comes to actually changing the world in front of us and showing people that something like a soccer ball that generates energy could also be an example of a whole new way of thinking about power. What ended up happening between then and now is that, yes, it did show people a lot of new things, but ultimately it showed me that maybe me and a group of, I don't know, people who love organized chaos, I guess, out of Harlem, New York, would actually be the ones to address the real problem, which is an infrastructural problem. So for the last three years, we've taken what is now 11 patents and patents pending, covering energy generation, transmission, and storage, specifically renewable energy, uh, and we've essentially translated that to developing an entire, essentially translated that to developing an entire system for building power infrastructure. So what we've developed is a way to build better power grids, a way to transform the ground that we walk on and the ground that we drive on, on into a system for transmitting power when it's needed, where it's needed. So the things that happened in California with PG&E, the time when a couple of months ago we just lost power in New York, those things get addressed because we have new, upgradable, affordable infrastructure that can fix the problems we have here in the United States and also finally bridge the gap in terms of actually having infrastructure in places like Nigeria. That's awesome. So Lindsay, a lot has changed for you over the past year, retirement from professional skiing and engagement, and you're becoming a business owner. Why did you decide to venture into the beauty industry? And what kinds of things are you focused on as you develop your brand, especially given the work you do with young girls on self-image? Um, I mean, it's not, I'm not changing the world and I'm not having electricity for everybody, unfortunately. It's a much simpler thing and I just needed to make up for the gym. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, I, when I skied um, almost my entire career, I always wore makeup. Um, I looked at it as kind of like my game face, you know, whenever I um, am out there on the mountain, I felt more confident um, when I had makeup on. And I also wear it to the gym and I just really struggled to find um, products that work for me. So, you know, before I retired, I had this thought in mind. Um, I knew it was going to be a tough transition. You know, I've been focused on the same thing uh, since I was nine years old, which is being the best skier in the world. And uh, it's bizarre now to wake up and I don't have that goal. But, you know, having this idea of a business that I wanted to create has helped me find um, a new motivation and a new passion. And um, it's, we're probably launching in May. Um, I just met Gwyneth Paltrow, so I'm really hoping that she's gonna help me too. Um, <laughs> so it's been a great day so far. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but we'll see. We were just saying backstage, famous people like meeting famous people too. <laughs> I'm not famous, but um, 
but Gwyneth is definitely famous. <laughs> <laughs> and she's definitely gorgeous and really smart. And she used a lot of words that I've never even heard before. And um, she gave me her cell, so I'm definitely going to be calling her. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> so, Julia, entrepreneurs often talk about turning their passions into businesses. You did that with Zoom and certainly with Planet Forward Ventures. Tell us how you leveraged your background in biomedical engineering and your passion for food to create a better food, for food future. Yeah. So for me, it's really sort of two things. The first is I realized early in life that I actually would never be very good at working for anyone else. Um, it's just not my orientation to be able to follow directions very well. And I generally like my own ideas and I like to bring them to life. So that's the first thing. Um, and the second is I grew up in this like really noisy, vivacious household where there was always something on the on the stove. There was always food. It was like a constant party at my house. There was never any notion of like setting four places and sitting down at 630. It was come one, come all. And so my house was full of all of these people from different walks of life. And food was the way that we connected. We would set the table and people would laugh and share stories and debate. So my understanding of what it means to feel loved, to feel connected, to feel safe, my understanding of what it means to feel human is always rooted in the tradition of sharing food together. So it's no accident that that's what I've chosen to do with my business. It just took me a little while to get the confidence, sort of like Jessica described, to get the confidence to say, actually, yes, I'm the person to take on these big issues and I'm the person to solve this problem. Awesome. I also just want to make a small point. As someone who works out five times a week, because this is not by accident, um, <laughs> we talked earlier that I'm showing Clav today. She's like, anyway, it's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you, because sometimes people are like, wait, hey, Jess, is that you when I'm working out? And I'm like, yes, how rude it is, But because I'm not wearing makeup, so it's a problem. <laughs> like, yes, how rude it is, But because I'm not wearing makeup, so it's a problem. Maybe Maybe not, like, it is a problem. Global problem. It's a, well, you be <laughs> like, there are people that are Women everywhere wanting makeup when they're working Maybe out. Maybe we all looked a little cuter when we worked out. Maybe we'd work out more. So. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a valid point. Putting it out there. I'm making the world healthier. I make sure. I, yeah, exactly. It it's all, all, all together. Thank you. Gosh, I feel Thank so much better. Thank you for that pause. No, 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 no. <laughs> Okay, so we'll go back to Jessica for a second. Uh, one of the themes that we've discussed today is building a network and a support system. And as you've scaled from something uh, as a startup to something bigger, did you build your own sort of personal board of directors when you needed guidance? And how did you balance their advice and then your, in, your own individual mm. instincts? You know, it's something that I'm actually more intentionally doing right now in this moment. Um, because for me, I realized that I was getting to a stage where very specifically the thing I wanted to do, no one had done before, right? I couldn't necessarily say, okay, where can I find, um, you know, a, a black woman who has developed hardware technology for an archaic industry and is attempting to, you know, launch it without losing who she is. It was all these different things. And then with a very diverse team as well, right? Um, that so I, I realize that it's really about having I think multiple uh, levels to it and recognizing that you need to be intentional. So there's executive coaches, um, and then there's having an amazing advisory board of individuals who have a very unique experience that's a slither of what I know I need. And then it's also about building CEO peer groups to a certain extent, and that that is probably the most important part because you need a group of people to tell you that you're not crazy because you will always feel like you're crazy. And then you'll find out that someone else is having that same, uh, that same problem. And so that's something that I've started to do more intentionally. Previously, you know, there was a time when there was only, I think, 35 black women who had raised more than a million dollars. And we all knew each other. And we were all in this group called Visible Figures. Uh, now there's definitely over 100. And um, we all kind of connect. and talk with each other more as well. And so the, the, those groups have definitely helped. But I think, especially as, as women, it's really important to intentionally say that's what you need to spend most of your time doing, constantly building what they call like is your kitchen cabinet. 
Yeah, I think that's great. Earlier in the day, we were talking about the, the notion of kind of asking for help. And I think yeah. Abby Wambach talked a lot about when you're struggling with something, it's actually easier when you're with the team, when you're with others. And that's sort of, I think, kind of what you're trying to do and something that we try to do with well, the firm too. We as women also have a tendency to like grit our teeth, right? Yeah, and go in. And just and go in. And I realized that I spend way more time like hearing everything about my boyfriend's career. And then he'll be like, how's it going? That goes fine. Uh, how did you do? It always gets done. It's fine. It's like, that's not what I asked. Well, that's what you meant. It's fine. How are you? And then you hear all the things as you're doing. And so it's like, we don't necessarily unload on people. We're, we are very good at keeping our issues in and then taking everything in and being the sounding board. Um, and I think it, it goes beyond vulnerability. It's really making sure you spend the time to workshop your thoughts and the things that are keeping you up and recognize that it's not a weakness to not know exactly what the next step is. Exactly. So, Lindsay, you founded the Lindsay Vaughn Foundation in 2015, and it's grown from a startup to a solid foundation. I love the message of the foundation and all that work that you're doing. Can you talk about why you chose to focus on empowering young female athletes and the challenges you see girls facing today? What are you hearing from them in some of your camps and sessions that you're having? I'm hearing a lot from girls. I learned that there's a such thing as visco girls. Has anyone ever or kids? My daughter told me about those too. <laughs> it's like this thing they do when you walk by. It's like... <laughs> Like, I don't even know what that is. I'm not cool. I'm 35 almost. <laughs> um, so I'm learning a lot from the kids. Um, but the reason why I wanted to empower them is because when I was nine years old, I met my to empower them is because when I was nine years old, I met my idol, Peekaboo Street, um, Olympic champion, and I met her for a minute and a half. And because of her, I wanted to be an Olympian. So at nine years old, I came home from uh, the ski shop with her autograph, and I said, Dad, I want to be in the Olympics. How do we do it? And he's like, all right, let's make a plan. Mm. We made like a 10-year plan, and at 17, I was in the Olympics. So that simple minute and a half meeting her, she smiled, took a picture, signed an autograph. That changed the course of my life. So I want to give that back, and I want to try to encourage kids to believe in themselves and to set really high goals, however unattainable they think they are, and give them the confidence to, to actually push forward and to, and to work on it and to, to believe in themselves. So, um, and, and it's not based on skiing. Like it, my foundation has nothing to do with skiing. It, uh, we have educational-based uh, scholarships. I uh, support STEM heavily. Um, you know, we have, Dix gave us a huge endowment or, uh, for $500,000, which is amazing. And we're doing uh, sports scholarships as well. But um, I just want them to believe in themselves, you know, kids these days with, um, you know, social media and their bullying and this fisco, whatever the hell it is. <laughs> It's like, it's so much to handle. I don't even, I don't know, you know, if I was in high school now, if I would survive, you know, it's incredible. Um, so I'm just trying to get rid of all that and and um, just develop basic confidence. Um, so we're, we're doing a great job. Chase has been a huge supporter. We also had a new, um, and we have strong girls camps. Um, we had them in New York and Baltimore this year. And uh, we have also a financial independence um, course, which is incredible. Um, I want kids to be independent financially as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's not something that's ever talked about. Um, I think in school, I learned how to balance a checkbook and that's all. And then I, you know, made it to the Olympics. I'm like, okay, so what do I do now? Um, and I got divorced, you know, and my husband had taken care of all my finances. And then I get divorced on my finances. And then I get divorced. I'm 26 years old and I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Um, so I want to try to help kids not go through the same mistakes that I did and, and try to empower them, you know, their mind, their body and their pocketbooks. So. Great, that's an awesome message. So Joy, I'll turn to you now. What was the single biggest challenge you faced as a female CEO and founder, both during the process of pitching to investors while expecting your son, Mosey, and in running your company day to day? Oh. Fundraising while black, female, and pregnant. <laughs> Girl. Let me tell you, when you drive up Sand Hill Road, where all the biggest, baddest venture capitalists are, in your 2006 Toyota, and you park it in a sea of Teslas, you might feel like you don't quite belong. 
and you walk into a conference room where the table feels like it's a mile long and it's filled with people, but not one of those people identifies as a woman and not one of them is a person of color, and you really start to feel like maybe you don't belong. Then you add in a big, beautiful, pregnant belly that probably taps the conference room table as you're sitting down. Or maybe you're breastfeeding and your boobs fill up with milk in the middle of a pitch. Gwyneth is cursed, so I can say boobs. Um, <laughs> then you're really in the, having this otherworldly experience that almost becomes comical. And so at a certain point, it was very clear that no matter what I did, no matter how much golf I played or sports center I watched, I was never going to fit in. And at the moment when I stopped trying, I just felt this huge weight lifted off my shoulders. And in that time, I really began to find what I would call my tribe, the people who had values that were aligned with mine, and the people that actually wanted me to be myself. That's great. I think uh, that imposter syndrome that gets us sometimes. You know, yeah. So, Lindsay, uh, we see you on TV competing and speeding down a mountain at 70 miles an hour, and you seem absolutely fearless doing that. Though most of us aren't facing that kind of physical challenge, we have all have moments that we have to psych ourselves up for. And what do you do before a race to p pump yourself up, and are you using those strategies now as you start your business? Um... I don't know. I felt like skiing was a lot easier than starting my own business. Um, I don't know. I never was afraid skiing. Um, you know, going 85 miles an hour down a mountain seemed perfectly normal to me. Um, you know, I definitely have a couple screws loose. But um, I don't know. I, I always... I always was driven, you know, I, I don't think I had one particular thing that pumped me up. I just wanted to win and I wanted to outwork everybody. Um, and so I think, you know, for me, starting my own business, I'm incredibly scared. Uh, starting my own business, I'm incredibly scared. Um, I'm, I found myself, I've never been scared before and I find myself scared because I don't want to fail. You know, I think that's maybe the only thing in my life that I that I don't want is to be a failure or to fail at something. And um, so I'm I'm trying the best I can to outwork everyone, um, which is difficult in this space. You know, beauty is something that everyone wants to jump on the bandwagon of. Um, but I think there is a need for this particular product in the marketplace. And you know, I know that from the women that I've talked to, from my friends, from my family, you know, I'm on the right track, but you don't know until you know. So um, I'm just keeping that work ethic and I'm hoping that um, that takes me to a point where I feel like I've, I'm successful, which I don't even know what that is really, but I guess if people like my products, then I think that would be a success. Great. So I'm just going to open this up, whoever wants to answer this. Do any of you have a story or an experience with an influential woman, either someone who actively supported you, and how did they do that, or even someone you wish had been more supportive, and how are you learning from that and potentially paying it forward? Hmm. You stumped us. No. first? <laughs> I guess... The woman who's incredibly influential in my life is my own mother. I was going to say the same. And so just watching the incredible milestones that she's achieved as a little five foot one, but mighty, mighty woman um, in the field of real estate development for many years. I just watched her, to Lindsay's point, have that incredible work ethic and show up every day with the desire to win. And may, while she may not have always been the person in the room with the most power, she demonstrated her power through her work ethic. And so I'm trying to do the same thing in the way that I raise my son and to be able to be that same kind of a role model for him. I definitely agree. I, it's funny, the first person that came to my mind was my mom. Um, you know, I often say that Nigerian moms are like tiger moms, but louder. So just <laughs> like, just be prepared. When you think a Nigerian is yelling at you, it's just us loving on you. That's just love. Um, and, you know, even just this morning, I was speaking to my mom and she doesn't even always know all the specific details. This is a, a woman who uh, technically has her master's in finance, um, you know, and she came, you know, from Nigeria and went through all the things just to be able to 
be a, a strong support, I think, um, for, my, for my father and for our family, but she's very much the chief of staff of the family, right? When, we, when, when, uh, when I had gotten into Harvard and she wasn't sure you know, if we would be able to afford it, what she did with that FAFSA form, I still do not understand. That's where <laughs> she brought out, like, and it was, it was unbelievable. And she just never, she never let me um, be satisfied. So right now I do something where I always have a to-do list that's longer than what I could feasibly get done in any day because I, I'm a goal-oriented person and I never want to be satisfied. And that's how I push myself. And it, even when I had, a, you know, I think been on the cover of Forbes and we had successfully raised our round, she's still like, Ose, um, you know, I was thinking, um, you know, you should get your law degree. I said, ah. I said, mom. I said, mom, I've, I've gone to Harvard undergrad, Harvard Business School. I've done successful things. Uh -huh, but still, uh, now, you know, I was thinking maybe JD and D MBA. I said, mom, you know, that kind of thing. Or she would watch, she would watch Oprah. Uh, like I remember when Oprah was on, and like, and she would see that some kid had like done coding or invented something, and then she would go to the bookstore and get some books and come to me and my sister, drop the books down, and be like, oh yeah. Are you forbidden to code? Do you see what he has done? You can do it too. We need to be rich. And I'd be like, <laughs> and me and my sister are there, like nine, just like, oh, all right. Picking up the coding books, like, well, all right. How? Let's let's come up with the video game she wants us to make. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, she's looking at it. I would do something. She's looking. She has not left the room. Let's see. So, and she literally reminded me of that story this morning, and then laughed, and she was like, tell them the story. Let's have them. <laughs> I was like, all right, mom, bet. I will. There you go. Thank you, mom. Thank you. So, uh, we'll start with Julia. What is some advice you would give your younger self? Hmm. So, you know, when you grow up as a little black girl in this country, one of the things that you hear often is you're going to have to work twice as hard to get half as far. And if you do the math in your head, you realize you're going to have to work four times as hard just to keep up. And so the math in your head, you realize you're going to have to work four times as hard just to keep up. And so I really spent my whole life trying to run four times faster just to keep pace. And by the time I got to my mid-30s, I just couldn't do it anymore. I was sort of on the cusp of a meltdown at 35, just from the internal pressure that I put on myself, let alone the societal issues that we all know too much about. So if I could go back and talk to my younger self, I would say, Julia, you know, the most important conversations that you have every day are the ones that you have with yourself. And to really invest in that radical self-acceptance, that radical self-confidence that has made me the incredibly happy person that I am today. Great. Do you want to answer that question too? Um, you guys are just full of great answers, and I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to keep up with you, so. Um, she might have a hard time on skis. <laughs> That's the truth. I got one thing. Maybe a snowboard. Maybe. Um, I mean, I think for me, I'm just, I think Gwen has said this earlier today. I know I'm kind of fixated on Gwyneth because she's awesome. Um, but she was saying that, you know, I allow myself to ask questions. And I think that's what I'm like focused on right now is kind of figuring my way into this new world of business. And um, I need to ask questions and I need to be a lot better at making connections. You know, I'm, I'm always the person that I love meeting people. I love talking to people. I love, um, you know, interacting. But I'm always I'm never the one to ask for questions you know, your number or, you know, how do I stay in touch? How do I make this connection into something valuable for both of us? And so that's something that I've really been trying to be better about is be confident enough in myself to say, I would love to connect with you further. You know, can we, can we exchange numbers? I'm not on LinkedIn. I think that's something I should be doing, but I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Someone told me it's important. My sister made me. Um, anywho, um, so that's something that I've been really working on is having the confidence to, you know, reach out and be connected. And I really did a good job with that today with Gwyneth. I got her number. Girl. <laughs> and, yeah. So I'm just, I need to be confident myself. That's what I'm working on. I'm not on the mountain anymore, but I need to believe in myself. There you go. Great. Awesome. 
Anything you want to add? Sure. Um, so I think for me, about almost a year ago to the day, I made the decision to start to, uh, I think, essentially prioritize self-care in a way that was acknowledging the fact that I had this one body, right? So I had always pushed myself, always, kind of, so I'm 31 and I can, I know exactly what you're talking about because I was getting towards this point where it was just unsustainable and I was up and down in weight and I'd be so stressed and I would be meditating or whatever, but it wasn't, it wasn't enough. It wasn't a consistent focus on my self-care. It was more, I would look at self-care when it, I had totally fallen on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I remember it's actually October 13th, 2018. I looked myself in the mirror. Uh, it was two days after Disney Demo Day when um, it became public that Disney had invested in our company. Uh, and I said, life is too short to not love the way you look and the way you feel. And what would happen if I took 20% of what I would normally put into my work, uh, you know, so sort of going from 150 to 130, and what if I put that consistently mindfully and intentionally into my self-care, what would happen? And so over the course of the last year, I lost 50 pounds. I started to sleep more. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I just started to balance more. And it's funny how these things kind of trickle down because now I, I, one thing I love as part of my whole thing is grapes. Like I'm just, I love grapes. And now everyone at my company loves grapes too. It's weird. We all just eat grapes and Brussels sprouts, but it, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a diet. It was, it was bad too. It's weird. We all just eat grapes and Brussels sprouts, but it, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a diet. It was, it was balanced. It was saying, you know what? It's not a thing to say, oh, I pulled X number of all nighters. This is a marathon. We're changing, you know, specifically in Uncharted Power, we're trying to change an industry that hasn't changed in 150 years. So this isn't something where you don't sleep for a week and think that you're going to get there. You have to be able to get up each day and really push. And the extent to which I found that balance would then kind of trickle down to my team and we'd have that balance. And so I, I wish, I think I figured it, I wish I figured it out sooner because this is actually now the longest ever that I've ever lost weight and kept it off and done so in a sustainable way. And, uh, it, you know, I went through a decade of my adult life not understanding why I couldn't keep my feet on the ground so, so stably. And so it's because we often think that the way to move forward is to focus on everything else but ourselves. And that's just not true. It, it actually, the buck stops with you and the extent to which you can get up and be your best self in that room and also have grace for yourself, it ends up extending much more sustainably throughout everything you do. That's great. So my last question, which you sort of answered, is uh, the one thing you've learned last year, it sounds like um, you, it's all about self-care, so. It's one big one. Lindsay, anything you'd like to add? Um, I mean, I think the biggest thing, like I said earlier, is just to ask questions. Like when I said, I feel like I said one in every single answer that I've <laughs> given you, but that's why these panels are really helpful because you learn something. Um, no, but I, I really need to ask questions. Um, you know, I'm learning in this process and, um, you know, the worst thing I can do is pretend like I know what I'm doing and, you know, go through meetings or, you know, be involved with people. And then, you know, the meeting's over and I have no idea what just happened, you know, so I'm, I'm trying my best to learn and um, ask everybody questions because I know some things, but I definitely don't know everything. Um, my father always used to say, he used to, he used to use the word epistemology, which is a study of things you don't know, which he's like, you know nothing. I'm like, all right, dad. Um, <laughs> so I'm just, I try to educate myself and try to surround myself with educated people, which I've clearly done today. So my dad would be <laughs> proud, um, but you know, ask questions and uh, learn from others. Julia? I think I've, yeah, I love that. <laughs> Really just in, uh, in, over the last year, I've begun to embrace the sweetness of slowing down. Mm. Uh, slowing down to be able to savor, to taste, to feel joy and pleasure in the work that I'm doing. Slowing down to be able to be more present with my little baby, which is a huge paradigm shift for any person. Um, and slowing down to Jessica's point in order to just really radically take care of myself and my own body. I always thought my superpower was that I could go faster than anyone else. 
um, I no longer want that to be my superpower. I want my superpower to be something different and to allow myself really to be more measured and to hasten slowly instead of rushing to the end. That's a great way to end. Thank you so much. <laughs> Julia, Lindsay, Jessica, thank you for being here today.